16 years old, my parents just got divorced, and my dad moved up to a little apartment above the Strip, and I went up to live with him. And I had my first camera, I was just kind of exploring the world, and I'd walk out and down to the Strip, and there would be John Lennon and the Beatles, 15 feet high, you know, these surreal hand-painted images, and I got excited. I just took a picture, and um, slowly over time, since I was there a lot, I noticed the guys touching them up and painting them, and installing and then taking them down. So I was aware at a very early age that these images were kind of uh, transitory, that they wouldn't be there long, and that they were hand-painted. So I got to know a few of the painters, and they were all these really cool guys. I mean, they were artists, and a lot of them exhibited their work or did things outside of that. That's how they made a living. And I got to watch these guys painting these things, and that's where you really get the true sense of the scale. I mean, the surreal sense when you see a guy painting a McDonald's hamburger bun, and his head is the side of one sesame seed. So that was really kind of the trip. So I really think it's a key element in the success of the Sunset Strip billboards that they weren't mass-produced images. They were hand-painted, and they really have a special quality. Jack Holtzman, who was the head of Electra Records, and he had the uh, vision to sign the doors to their record album contract, and to create the first billboard on the Sunset Strip. At the time, I think, when he took that billboard for the doors out in 1967, it cost $1,000 for the month, which was probably a lot of money back then. It was probably, you, know, you could probably buy a car for $3,000. So it wasn't a pittance, but it, you know, it was a bit of an investment. He thought that the disc jockeys who decided what got played on the radio in those days would see it and that it would create an impression on them. And it wasn't cool then to advertise on TV. There's no way you'd ever see the Doors or the Beatles advertising on television. People have said, oh man, they're selling out. That's like so establishment. You know, that's how people thought that then. So the billboards were, were one of the rare cool ways that they could advertise and let people know a new record had come out. In the music industry, which had been pretty much in New York up until the mid-60s, started focusing on L.A., coming to L.A. because all the music was happening here. Um, you had some great nightclubs on the Strip, the Whiskey or Go-Go, Gazzari's. You had these great record stores, Tower Records, Licorice Pizza. So and there was a whole sort of youth scene going on that was coming to the West Coast, a little bit in San Francisco, but to a great deal on the Sunset Strip was where it was centered. The record companies had their offices there. So for that period from around 1967 to the 80s, it really was sort of the heartbeat of the music industry globally. I mean, that's where, where all the music was happening. And so the billboard it meant that you had arrived in the, in the music business. And so all the big stars wanted them uh, at that time. You know, I think by the mid-70s, California had become really the center of the global center of the rock and roll universe. And there were hit-making groups like the Eagles, Hotel California. So not only was the music being made here by musicians who lived here from record companies that were based here, but it was about here. The imagery was about here. People like Jackson Brown and Joni Mitchell and Neil Young, they were writing songs about their experiences. And a lot of their experiences were about, you know, had the feel of the desert and the beach and what was going on in California. So I think there was a specific sound and look at that period, and it just somehow captured the feel of what it felt like to be here in California in this kind of freewheeling, mobile, you know, culture. I think the whole world was really kind of, you know, into that at that point. I think it got a lot of people to want to come to California and to be part of that scene. My father, Felix Landau, was one of the early art galleries in Los Angeles on La Cienega. He started in the late 40s but throughout the 50s and 60s had a very influential gallery in La Cienega. And that was a big influence just in terms of appreciation of visual side of things. And then I think when I saw the billboards, I recognized in them kind of a kindred spirit with a pop artist. This was kind of instant pop culture happening, you know, before my eyes on the strip. And at a certain point, it felt like the strip was like a drive through art gallery. Billboards really flourished up until the early 80s, and they probably would have kept going, except uh, MTV came along, and all of a sudden, anybody who wanted to really promote themselves to a large audience had to have a music video. And then I think because of that, then TV became a very acceptable way for people to relate to rock and roll music and to experience it. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, in a sense, everything's ephemeral. But in LA, the LA culture seems to be sort of hyper ephemeral. And it's something I've come to embrace. And it's something I've, that the billboards got me thinking about was how these things that we sort of grow up with or get used to or that represent landmarks to us come and go so quickly. So I've tried to document as, as many of those as, as I could. And it speaks about our culture, our times, and our city. Had these pictures not been taken, that whole period would have been lost to the ages. So uh, I'm happy in that sense, uh, you know, that, these, that they exist.